Today in Stagecraft, we are going to discuss a pirate's favorite stagecraft subject. Wait, wait, whoa, whoa, what's a, what's a pirate's favorite subject? Hardware. The first piece of hardware we're going to talk about are screws. Screws are fasteners used for adhering one material to another using a mechanical fastening device. Uh, and typically, you're going to apply pressure to the head of the screw yes. as opposed to something else. Yes. Drywall screws are the most common screws you find in the theater. Uh, they're initially meant to be used for attaching drywall to wood, but in theater we use them for attaching just about any material to another material. Uh, come in a variety of lengths, also come in different uh, threads. Threads are the kind of spiral cuts down the screw that help pull the screw into the material when you're applying pressure to the head. Uh, probably the first one to talk about would be a coarse head through, so yeah, coarse thread screw. Sorry, uh, coarse thread just means it's got a larger, deeper thread cut to it, so it will bite or grab the material better. Uh, fine thread screws means the threads are closer together and not as deep. They don't hold as well, but they do work and can be used in a pinch. And unfortunately, some of the really short lengths of screw are only available in fine thread screws. That is very true. Uh, common sizes are all the way from a three quarter inch all the way on the right, all the way to a three inch all the way in the center. Yes, and those are the ones that are commonly used in theater. You can get a longer screw, but you can't just go to Lowe's and purchase that off the shelf. They have to be special ordered. Nor would you really want to because it's a six inch screw. That's very true. Lag screws are commonly used in place of a bolt when you can't get to the other side of the material to put a nut on it for tightening. Uh, they work in the same fashion as a screw, except instead of having uh, like a Phillips head or flat head, you have to use a different type of uh, tool for fastening. A socket and driver usually works the best. Uh, they come in a lot of sizes. The three that are most commonly used in theater are a quarter inch, five sixteenths, and three eighths of an inch. And that refers to the how wide the threads are. So a 3 8 inch screw from thread point to thread point is 3 8 of an inch. The head, however, is not 3 8 of an inch. That's actually 9 16 inches. So when you go to get a socket for driving these into the wood or material, you have to get the appropriate size socket to drive it. You could try to use another, like a crescent wrench. It doesn't work very well. Now, because you can't apply the force downward toward the shaft of the crescent wrench. Yes. Like you would with a, a socket driver. Yeah, you have to have that driving, pushing force. Uh, wood screws are just another type of screw used for holding, well, you guessed it, wood together. Uh, they don't, they aren't great for other materials. They're mostly used in furniture construction. Uh, they're a softer material than, say, the drywall screws. They're not steel. Uh, they're generally brass or nickel or just some softer material. Uh, commonly com come in kind of that goldish color or hue. Uh, really nothing super special about them except that the head has that kind of bugle shape. And so whatever you're fastening them into, you have to do a countersink into the material so the head winds, winds up being flush with the material. They won't just pull the head into the material because they're so much softer. And also you can sometimes uh, crack the wood if you try to just yes. suck it down in there. And, and you don't want to crack your wood. No. A pan head screw, also commonly called a sheet metal screw. Uh, they're just, they're another type of screw for fastening material together. Usually used for fastening metal to metal, like thin pieces of sheet metal. Uh, the pan head though refers specifically to the head type. Uh, instead of being a bugle shape to go into a countersink, they're more of a mushroom or dome head, so it sits on top of the surface of the material and won't pull into it. Helps hold them together better. Masonry screws. They are the only screw on the market that is blue. If you walk into any hardware store and ask for a masonry screw, it will be blue. You cannot miss it. Uh, they're used for adhering things to concrete or stone. You can use them in wood. I wouldn't recommend it because it just chews the wood up. Uh, but they come in a variety of lengths, also in different diameters. Uh, heads also come different. You can get some where it's just a Phillips head, 
or you can get them where it's just a hexagonal head like the wag screw, or they sometimes come in a combination where either tool could be used. I prefer to use a socket for attaching them because you get more turning force out of a socket and driver. Uh, the other interesting thing about them is that they have two threads. There's an outer thread and an inner thread. The threads just help grip into the stone or mason material. That's really all that they do. They just give you a lot more gripping force. Uh, Self-tapping screws. These are a fairly unique screw used for attaching some material to steel. You could be plastic, wood, whichever, but they're meant for attaching stuff to steel. Uh, the tip of the screw, instead of being pointed with the threads going all the way down, actually has a little notch cut into it to act like a drill bit. Uh, tapping is the skill or art of putting threads into metal, and you have to drill a hole first. So that little tip drills the hole in the steel, and then once the screws catch in the steel, it kind of threads the metal to draw the screw down into it. Uh, now the head for a self-tapping screw commonly are a hexagonal shaped head. I've only a couple times seen a Phillips head self-tapping screw, but usually they're the hex head with that little built-in washer on the bottom to help distribute load and hold them tight. We used uh, tech screws frequently which had a Phillips head on them. Yes, so uh, and actually sometimes they can be called tech screw. Depends where you are in the country and what lingo you learned. Bolts are different from screws in that they're typically you would drill a hole or find a hole in a material. We call those magic holes. Holes that appear out of nowhere <laughs> that accept a bolt where you need it to be. Um, uh, drill a hole in a, in a piece of material and then put a bolt through it and then typically put a washer or a, and a nut on the other side of the bolt to um, fasten materials together, items together. Yeah, and just like a screw, they do have a thread pitch on it, but typically the thread pitch is a, a, a smaller yeah. thread pitch on it. Smaller thread pitch and it has a uh, complementary or negative thread into the, in the nut that you put on it. So we're like a screw, when you put it into a piece of wood, it creates its own threads. Gotcha. But the device, the nut that you put on the bolt, has already has threads in it. <coughs> this is a regular old hex bolt. Uh, when you go to the store and buy bolts, pretty much what you're gonna buy is a hex bolt. It has a hex shaped head on it. Um, there's a whole series of combination of wrenches out there that are designed to fit over the bolt, the head of the bolt. They come in pretty standard sizes. Um, and then there's also very specific standards about the, the diameter of the bolt, the threaded part of the bolt. Bolts are measured by the, di the diameter of the threaded portion of the bolt, and they come in very specific sizes. They come in um, English sizes, quarter inch, half inch, five sixteenths of an inch, and so on and so forth. Um, and then there are also metric sizes. Um, in the United States, primarily, it's all... The stuff you go to the hardware store and buy is going to be... You know, English in in inches. Yeah. Although a lot of automotive stuff is is metric, and so it's and a lot of the the build it yourself at home furniture comes with metric bolts in it too. So it can get kind of confusing. Um, <coughs> this is a pretty common uh, fastener, and again, accepts nuts and washers and whatnot. The carriage bolt is designed primarily to fasten wood together. So you drill two you know a hole in two pieces of wood, put the bolt through, put a nut and washer on the other side. Um, and the reason, um, but it has a, it's different from a hex bolt in that it has this square shoulder um, underneath the dome head. Uh, so when you, you drill a hole in the bolt in the board, you put the bolt through the hole, and you put the nut and the washer on the other side, you tighten the nut down, and the square shoulder digs into the wood and pulls the dome head down. So it has a nice smooth dome on the outside of the head. Um, on the, the only thing sticking out on the on one side of it is the is the smooth dome of the head, and this was uh, this came from building carriages back before we had cars. You know, everybody had a horse and carriage, and um, the first bolts had these big ugly square heads on them. And some guy I don't even know who the inventor is. Usually, I know this kind of information. I don't know who invented the carriage bolt. Um, but anyway, it has this smooth um, head on the outside of the carriage, so it doesn't catch on. Horses, clothing, tack, you know, things like that. Um, and it uses the same threading and the same washers and nuts and stuff that regular bolts do. 
This is an eye bolt. Again, it uses the same threads and nuts and washers and whatnot as you know carriage bolts and hex bolts. Um, this particular example of an eye bolt, well, let's talk about the eye first. The eye is formed, they take a piece of rod, they put threads on it, and then they bend a loop in one end of it to make the eye. To, and you'd use this to you know hang your porch swing or whatever to attach a bolt to a board and then use the eye of it to attach a rope or a hook or um, cable or chain or something like that um, <clears throat> to, a, to a board or a building or whatever. Um, this particular example is just a piece of rod that's been bent into a loop to form the eye. Um, this is what you're going to commonly find at hardware stores. Um, they're not rated per se, though. I mean, they'll hold up as much they'll hold up as much weight as will they'll support until the eye straightens out. <laughs> if you overload it, the, the eye will straighten out because it's not connected. This is bent into a loop. Um, if you're doing something that you need. An app, you have an application where failure is not acceptable. Uh, and you have a lot of weight. <laughs> right. Um, they do make eye bolts in a, that are called forged eye bolts. And basically, it's a different type of construction. They take a, a solid piece of steel and put it in a, in a set of dies and smash it together. And it creates a bolt that's, that has an eye in the end of it. It's forged out of one solid piece of metal. It's not bent out of a piece of quote unquote wire. I know it's it's not wire it doesn't look like wire but in bolt manufacturers it's considered wire um, because it's a round long rod of, of material um, the next bolt is the useless bolt I mean the u-bolt um, we don't find a lot of applications for this in the theater but it does it does have a handy purpose occasionally um, it's basically a, a just like the rest of the bolt the, the carriage bolt the eye bolt the hex bolt uses the same threads and nuts and whatnot and everything, um, but it's a, just a piece of rod that's bent into a U shape and then threaded on both ends. Um, also comes with this cute little plate, sometimes called a bridge. Um, it's basically an overgrown washer with two holes in it, and so it, it maintains the span, the spacing between the two legs of the of the U bolt, and um, and acts like a washer. It clamps the the whatever the material is. Typically, you would use this for attaching a round thing to a flat thing, like a piece of wood to a piece of pipe, or something along that line. Attaching a piece of pipe to the side of a building or a piece of scenery or whatever. Um, also, sometimes it's called a muffler clamp, although a muffler clamp does a slightly different thing, and, and the bridge is quite different because it's designed to go around a, a round pipe, so the bridge has a uh, uh, more of a saddle shape to it. The next component of hardware we're going to talk about is nuts. Nuts are used with bolts, which was just recently discussed. They are a threaded component for fitting on different bolts to and, hold things together. And different from the bolts, the threading is actually on the inside of the piece of hardware and not on the outside, and that's so that it can match to the bolt. Uh, the first type of nut is a good old hex nut. It's a hexagonal piece of steel with threads cut in the center of it to fit onto a bolt. Uh, the inside of the nut needs to match the outside diameter of a bolt. So if you have a 3 8 inch bolt, you need a 3 8 inch nut so that way it will fit on there. Sometimes you can slip a nut onto a bolt, but it needs to thread to actually work or to engage properly. Uh, other type of nut is a wing nut, also sometimes called a finger nut, because you only tighten it with your fingers. That's why it has those two little kind of Mickey Mouse tabby things on the sides. There are no tools made for tightening a wing nut onto a bolt. They're meant to be taken off and put on easily by your fingers. A nylock nut, or locking nut, is a special type of nut. Uh, it's got the same hexagonal shape as a hex nut, but at the very top of it, there's this added piece of nylon in a little dome enclosure. As you thread the nut onto a bolt, the nylon will then start to cut to the same thread pitch or thread count as the bolt. This helps create kind of a friction surface between the nut and the bolt. Uh, the reason you would do this is so that way the nut doesn't come off easily, say through vibration or agitation of something rolling across stage. You want that nut to stay locked in place, and this nylon helps hold it in onto the bolt so it won't just fall off. 
Washers are typically flat pieces of metal or plastic um, and they are round with a hole in the center and they are used uh, in conjunction with a bolt or a screw and as the bolt or screw is applied to a piece of material like wood or metal the washer helps distribute that pressure out so it doesn't chew into the wood or, or break the wood or metal or plastic. Flat washers are typically your most common washer. Um, a flat washer is usually identified by the fact that the hole in the center tends to be about half the diameter of the total diameter of the washer. Fender washers are a little bit different from flat washers because the hole is a little bit smaller in diameter. Um, these are more often more commonly used with screws uh, and they're also used to hold typically things like um, foam when you're attaching foam onto a piece of wood or something like that the foam is is difficult to hold on there with just a screw so a fender washer is used to put uh, the screw into the foam and hold it in place a locking washer sometimes known as a spring washer um, is typically used to apply pressure to the nut um, or the bolt so that whenever you tighten it the pieces that are separate from uh, each other right there will compress down and apply a pressure outwards towards the head of the bolt or towards the nut and that pressure creates a much tighter seal making, making it a lot more likely the nut is going to stay tight um, if there's a situation where there's a high vibration um, or there's a lot of uh, wiggling or jiggling of the, the thing that's being tightened down locking washers are really useful for uh, keeping nuts and bolts tight. Now we're going to talk about hinges. Hinges are a piece of hardware that have two part component with a pivot for opening or closing things. It's commonly found on doors or scenery that needs to move in some fashion. Uh, most common type of hinge you will find is called a butt hinge. Uh, it's called a butt hinge for when you attach it to a door and the door closes, the, door, the edge of the door that the hinge is attached to butts into the frame. Uh, they're typically a brass color, sometimes can be silver, and the corners on the hinge can be rounded or square. Uh, most of the time, well not most of the time, all the time, they come with a hinge pin. The hinge pin is a cylindrical shaft that runs through the two sides, giving them a folding flap. Sometimes it is a fixed pin, which means it cannot be removed, or it is a loose pin. So the pin can be removed for separating components. A back flap hinge looks very similar to a butt hinge, but is a smaller, more square shaped hinge. Easily hidden, easily to attach to any part of scenery. Uh, they're just, they're very, very useful for attaching parts of scenery that need to come apart. Most of the time you'll find them in a loose pin application. Not, not as often you'll find a fixed pin. A strap hinge is a unique hinge used for bearing a lot of weight on both sides of the hinge. Uh, if you think about a large barn door, a large barn door takes a lot of weight. A couple of these hinges attached to it will help bear the load. Uh, that's why it's that triangular shape on both ends. It gives you more surface area to distribute the weight over it. A T-hinge is kind of a combination hinge where one side is a butt hinge the other end is a strap hinge. Uh, those are used if you happen to have a smaller surface area to work with uh, for attaching the butt side instead of having larger space for attaching the strap side. A comical name that someone came up with many years ago was to refer to it as the butt strap hinge. Piano or continuous hinge. Uh, either name is acceptable. They are a long hinge. They come in various lengths, uh, usually ranging from 18 inches up to 6 feet, uh, depending where you want to purchase them from. The advantage to this really long hinge is if you have a long surface area that needs to fold or bend, uh, like up the edge of a f two flats, a longer hinge will give you a sturdier surface, or if you have a piano top that needs to open and close. One of the nice things about a piano hinge is you can cut them into smaller hinges. If you cut them at where the barrel brakes are between the two halves, you can make smaller or just different sizes that are they're extremely versatile. A cafe hinge are the hinge of doom in theater. 
Uh, if you've ever watched a movie where the waiter comes through the door and the door does kind of a flap flap action before it stops, that's done with a cafe hinge. It is a double barreled hinge with a spring built into it that you can set or load using little special rods so that the tension will cause the door to stop at a certain moment. The reason of the bane of theater is to load those little springs, you have to pry them both two halves open take a pin, insert it into a special hole, and kind of wind the spring like winding a clock watch. If you happen to let go though while you're doing that, it will snap around and smack your fingers. And if it's attached to a piece of scenery, that hurts even more because now you have a bigger thing coming around to smack your fingers. A spring hinge is similar to the cafe hinge, but only one so it only has one barrel that has a spring attached to it. Uh, if you think about it like a mouse trap, if you let go of the one side, the other half will flip shut. These are commonly found on old screen doors, where instead of having that door armature that slowly closes the door, it will actually spring or slap the door shut. Uh, they could be used in other applications in theater than just for doors. If you need uh, something to do a trick on stage that has to close quickly, or close on its own, or something needs to pop in the air, you can attach them to just about anything and pull a release to give the spring tension. The next piece of hardware that we are going to talk about is a caster. Now a caster, in essence, is some piece of mounting hardware that is attached to some sort of wheel. The first caster that we're going to talk about is a straight caster, also known as a dumb caster, and the mounting hardware is welded or fixed in place to the piece that connects to the wheel. So the wheel can really only turn in the forward or backward direction. It can't swivel left and right. The swivel caster or the smart caster is the part that does allow the swivel. Uh, it has a, a similar mounting fixture with the four points that affixes to some sort of wagon or box, road case, anything like that. But on this particular wheel, it will swivel left and right. A lot of times the smart caster and the dumb caster are used in conjunction with each other to allow a box to be able to roll in one direction. It's very similar to the way that your car's front wheels are able to turn left and right, but your car's back wheels don't. A lot of times boxes will end up with four smart casters, and those can be actually a little bit more difficult to steer. The last we're going to talk about is what's called a triple swivel. Now in this particular instance, we've got three small swivel casters attached to one sort of triangle hardware piece and then on top of that is another swivel mounting hardware. This is typically used for much 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 heavier pieces of scenery or equipment and it spreads the load out a little bit farther so that it's not all loaded up on one piece of, of caster, it's loaded up on three casters and so in essence you have four triple swivels, so you have a total of 12 wheels distributing the total weight of whatever it is that you're, that you're rolling around. Tape is one of those items that's not necessarily a piece of hardware, as it's not made out of steel or metal or any type of metal material. Uh, it's a thing that is used for holding other stuff together. It's used a lot in theater with multiple applications. Uh, gaff tape or gaffer's tape is probably the most common type of tape you're going to find in theater. Uh, it's also commonly found in the film and in television industry. Uh, it's a cloth back tape that has a sticky residue on one side that the great part about the sticky is it's sticky enough to hold things together but not so sticky that when you peel it off when you're done that it leaves a gross icky residue. It's a fairly clean surface once you've pulled the tape off but that also depends how long the tape has been sitting there. If it's been there for a really long period of time, it will leave a gross residue, but it's fairly easy to clean off. Uh, the cloth part of the tape is great because it's paintable. It will take paint, just like wood or muslin or any fabric or cloth of that nature. Uh, the other really nice thing is you can get it in different widths and lengths. Uh, the tape can be stitched together, and sometimes as you unroll a roll of gaff tape, you will find a spot where two parts of tape have been sewn together to make a longer piece. And the only bad part is you can't put that piece on scenery because when you paint it you see the stitches. They're so large that you cannot hide them. 
Uh, masking tape is a tape that is used in the paint industry. Uh, it is a paper type of tape, not meant to take paint. It's actually meant to repel paint or keep paint from seeping under. Uh, masking is taping over an area so you do not get paint on a surface that you don't want to get it on. Uh, commonly it comes in this manila creamy type color. That's the very inexpensive type of masking tape. Uh, the blue painter's tape is a masking tape. It has an extra plastic additive in it. And the green frog tape has this really awesome paint repelling stuff in it that works better than any tape I've ever used. Spike tape is another cloth bag tape. It's made in the same process as gaffer's tape, uh, but it comes in a larger variety of colors. Uh, generally the colors are for different set pieces or placement of set pieces. Uh, spiking is marking the stage floor for where you want to put scenery or an actor or anything on stage and you want it to happen every time in the exact same spot over and over. Uh, the colors help if you have a desk that has to move around a room and be in different locations throughout the show. During one scene it could be an orange spike, the next scene it's a pink spike, the next scene it's a blue spike. So it gives you a lot of versatility in how you want to lay out and mark where things go on the stage. Electrical tape is tape that's used with electricity. It is a rubber tape, so it's non-conductive. means you won't get a zap if you touch it after it's been wrapped around something, in theory. Uh, sometimes it can get little tears, or it can be very cheap electrical tape and not be as resistant to electrical flow. Uh, but generally it will stop anything electrical from passing through something. Uh, it comes in a variety of colors, mostly for color coding wires. Uh, you may have a bunch of wire that is all the same color, uh, like brown, and if they're running to different things, you want to color code which wire runs to what. It just helps you track and problem solve better. Uh, usually if, when you have two wires though, you take a wire nut, after you've twisted the wires together, put that on, the electrical tape is then used to hold the wire nut onto the wires. Uh, if you have a lack of wire nut in a pinch, you can just wrap electrical tape around the two connecting wires, but that's not recommended. Duct tape, also known as babysitter tape, can be used for holding anything together, especially children to walls or roommates. Uh, not the children to the roommates, but roommates to walls. Duct tape is a plastic tape with a super sticky backing on it. It will stick to just about everything. Uh, the plastic is really useful for wrapping around things you don't want stuff to leak through. Air, water, gases, anything that you want to wrap up tight and make them sealed. Uh, you can't paint duct tape. It is a water resilient tape. It, you can get paint on it but it will just flake off after you, it gets bent or anything. Uh, it tears in a straight line, but it cannot be s stretched apart. If you try to take two ends and pull them apart, it won't do that very well. It seriously is used for holding everything together. Cars, airplanes, you can make a cup out of it, shoes, pretty much anything you want. Dance floor tape is a specialty type of tape used only in the theater industry. Uh, it is a plastic tape or rubberish plastic tape, very similar to electrical tape, but not as electrically resilient or resistant. Uh, dance floor is a special type of traveling floor that's called marley. It's a rubber, and when you take strips of it and put it together to create a floor, use dance floor tape to seam the two pieces together. It then gives a smoother surface for dancing. Also has the same feel to it on bare skin, like bare feet. Uh, the other nice thing with it being rubber, rooms generally will get warm or get cool, and things expand or contract depending on the temperature. With the tape being rubber, it will move with the floor. It won't buckle or bind or do anything that it shouldn't, to make the floor unsafe for the dancers. What is glue? 
Glue is an adhesive. It's not really a, a hardware, or it's not really a fastener, um, but it glues stuff together. We use it a lot in scenery. Wood glue, regular old wood glue, um, is uh, designed to glue wood together. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, it's a it's a special blend of stuff. It to the works really well with wood fiber. Um, one of the things about wood glue is it's, well, with all adhesives really, is it needs a lot of surface area to get a good, to provide a strong bond. Um, and so what you, what you, whenever you squirt it on the, on the piece of material, notice that we just got a little thin strip of it coming out of the bottle here. Once you've done that, then you're going to spread it around with your finger or with a spreader or some kind of a stick or putty knife or something to spread it around so you get a nice thin layer of glue over the entire surface of the two things that you're gluing together. And it also locks, likes a lot of pressure. The thinner the layer of glue between the two pieces of material, the, the stronger bond that it will have. Um, so once you, you know, put your glue on there, spread it around a nice thin layer, put the other piece of material on there and clamp the fool out of it. Grab a bunch of clamps, clamp it down nice tight, watch the glue squirt out from between the edges, um, and you get a nice good bond. The other point is that um, if you've done it right, if you try and separate those two pieces of wood after you've glued them together, it will actually shear the wood away. The glue bond will be stronger between the, the two pieces of material than the, the wood actually to itself. So you'll actually break the wood instead of separate the glue. Which is why if you're trying to take apart a piece of scenery and you know you're going to be taking it apart, you probably shouldn't glue it first. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. White glue. Regular old white glue. A, a really great universal adhesive. Works on a lot of stuff. Really works best with wood fiber products. Paper is the, is the prime example there. Um, it's a really good, it's kind of like water's the universal solvent. It's, the, it's a good universal adhesive. Um, it glue a lot of the stuff together. It doesn't work on with every material, but it works really well with a lot of materials. And again, depends on surface area. The more surface area you have, the more, um, the more, the stronger bond that you're going to get. And works it makes a really good wood glue if you don't have wood glue. So if you run out of wood glue, go grab the white glue and finish up. Construction adhesive, uh, basic uh, um, uh, oil, whatever oil, petroleum based. <laughs> um, collection of adhesives. Most of this comes from, from petroleum. Um, oh, as you can see, there's a wild variety of choices in the, in the construction adhesive realm. Um, it comes in a caulking tube. You need a caulking gun to, to squirt the stuff out. Um, and it's usually kind of thick. Um, but again, it comes in a wild variation of uh, flavors um, for different applications. And so, um, when you go to buy the stuff, make sure you know what your application is. Um, primarily for, from the construction industry, they're building buildings with this stuff um, to put materials on, you know, subfloors and, and flooring, um, wallboard, foam, insulation, things like that. Um, most of the construction adhesives will eat foam, the extruded polystyrene pink, white, or pink, yellow, blue foam, um, or the white beaded foam. Um, some, most of the construction adhesives will dissolve that, and so it doesn't work as an adhesive for those. There are foam-specific adhesives for if you're, you know, gluing on insulation or using foam in your in your project. There are foam-specific construction adhesives, so make sure you know what your application is whenever you go to buy this stuff. Um, most of the stuff is designed for gluing wallboard on walls, foam on the outside of buildings, um, and flooring applications, and so. Um, Wild, wild collection of choices. Hot glue, the most overrated, and at the same time the most underrated adhesive of all time. There are some people that will try and fix anything with this. Got a flat tire? Got a problem? No problem. Got a broken pencil? No problem. <laughs> Got a chipped fingernail? No problem. I mean, it's unbelievable what people try and fix with this stuff. And for that reason, it's overrated. For the other, the other side of the coin is it's fairly underrated is because it will do a lot of stuff. It's a really great adhesive. Um, it will glue, you can use it in a wild variety of applications and um, it, it really can do wonderful things. It really requires a balance though. There's a lot, you know, there's a point at which it becomes ridiculous to use it for everything. Um, so 
choose your applications wisely. Um, the other thing about hot glue is it can be a little bit dangerous um, because it does require a separate device, um, a heat, uh, a glue gun, if you will. Looks kind of like a gun. Has a tube in the top of it. Has a heater in it. And you plug it in and put the. This is the, the picture you see here. Is the glue stick that goes in the back of the gun, and then there's some kind of apparatus to feed the glue into the heater, which then squirts out as liquid glue out of the tip of the gun, and. Um, Sometimes if you you know you can get burnt with the gun, you can squirt hot glue on your hand, which will burn you, um, things like that. So there is some danger to be, you know, to this stuff. It can be dangerous. I've seen some pretty good burns from this stuff. Um, some of the cheaper guns, you, you you actually push instead of squeezing a trigger to pull the, the glue into the gun, you actually push with your thumb on the back of the stick. And some of those guns I've seen where somebody pushes on the back of the stick and it squirts hot melted glue out the back of the gun and it gets on their hand can be quite a painful injury so be real careful of the of the hotness of the glue contact adhesive this is one flavor of contact adhesive 3m makes a lot of variations on the theme um, this is spray 90 and super 77 um, and they're they work pretty well for foam for basically anything really do require um, back to the thin layer of glue and the really good surface contact between the two things you're gluing together got to have a lot of surface area and got to have a really good contact if you got two things that are all lumpy and bumpy and you're trying to glue them together they don't it doesn't work very well because all the tops of the bumps are sticking together and not the entire surface of the of the materials are sticking together so the smoother the surfaces are of the two things you're trying to attach together the better success you're going to have Contact cement's a little bit different because, like for instance, we're talking about wood glue, you put a bunch of glue on one thing, you slap the other, you spread it around, you slap the other thing there, you clamp the crap out of it, and it glues together. Contact adhesive, you do it a little bit differently in that you have two surfaces. You put contact cement on contact adhesive, contact cement, same difference. Um, contact cement on on both of the surfaces and then you let it dry quite a bit one of the tricks is if you you put it on the you put the the adhesive on the surface as you touch your finger to it if you pull your finger away and you can see the glue sticking to your finger at all it's too wet so wait just a little bit and then once it's dry you put the two surfaces together and they stick together permanently forever and ever on in well, it depends. Super 77 is actually repositionable, but, but most of the contact cements are designed to be stuck together one time and one time only. The downside is that if you stick them together crooked or incorrectly, you've got a wrinkle in your piece of paper or something like that, getting that out of there is really impossible. So there's a lot of tricks to, to making sure that you get it positioned exactly perfectly before you stick it together and that you stick it together one time and that it's stuck together forever. Um, Again, these are two cans of spray that, that spray onto the surface. There's several varieties of contact cement that you paint onto the surface. And again, they come in, in several different flavors. So like, check your application. What materials are you, are you sticking together? And then compare that to what kind of adhesive that you want. 3M makes, I don't know how many different flavors of contact A cement. A lot. But yeah, but for foam and for everything else. So good stuff. And now we have specialty hardware. Uh, this could be really anything um, that we've picked four things, three or four things here to talk about. The first thing being the coffin lock. The coffin lock is a um, was originally designed to hold coffins closed. Um, it comes in two pieces. Um, one half would bolt to one piece of scenery, the other half would bolt to the other piece of scenery, and then it's got this cam that folds between the two, rotates between the one half into the other half, um, and locks the piece, the two things together. Um, it's fairly strong little connector, um, fairly inexpensive. Um, there are higher end versions of this that can get quite expensive. Um, this one's operated with a hex wrench or an Allen wrench um, and can make for really fast uh, scenery load ins. You drag the stuff out and set it up together, lock it together, walk away. Real quick, same thing for strike. Makes it real fast and easy. The next thing we have is our key clamps. Um, <clears throat> these are socket pipe connectors. Um, key clamp is a brand name. Um, there's several other manufacturers that make similar types of products, um, but they're designed to be used with just regular standard, you know, buy it at the store pipe sizes. Um, and there's, there's a cast fitting. You cut a piece of pipe to whatever length you need. You stick it in the in the socket. You tighten the little set screw down, and it holds it together. It was originally designed 
Um, this set of connectors was really originally designed to put in really fast and quick handrailing systems. Um, they used them for scaffolding and handrailings and other industrial applications. We in theater, we always just steal technology and stuff from other industries to make our lives easier. Um, come in a variety of sizes, um, and these are this is four different uh, pieces that they sell. There's probably 30 or 50 or 100 different configurations of of you know angles and combinations of sockets and things. Um, but yeah, they're real handy um, to have in a, in your inventory. Cheeseboro. Uh, this is another. It's a scaffolding. It came out of the scaffolding industry. Um, another thing we've stolen. Um, it's designed to connect two pieces of pipe together. You see in this top picture, you know, how two pieces of it used a couple two pieces of pipe. They come in two different varieties. Um, there's a fixed 90 degree um, cheeseboro that has you know one pipe is 90 degrees to the other one, and it doesn't. You can't change that angle. The one in the bottom here. Um, is, is a swivel connector, has a swivel between the two halves, and so you, you can set whatever angle you need it to be um, to connect your pipes together. Shopping resources. Um, there are several industry resources out there that we, several companies that we buy a lot of stuff from. Some of them are industry specific to the entertainment industry. BMI Supply is one of those uh, industry specific companies. They sell a lot of you know theater supplies, gaff tape, lighting equipment. Um, hardware, all kinds of stuff like that, lamps, foam, foam cutters, um, stuff like that. They have several offices. I'm not sure where they're all located. They're, they originated out of the south, but they kind of cover the whole nation now. The next company is McMaster Car. This is an, uh, more of a, a, a maintenance repair and overhaul company that serves manufacturing and all kinds of other businesses, but they have a lot of hardware um, I have a really awesome 4,000 page catalog that's just amazing. Um, and they're, they're a nationwide company uh, and they have a just unbelievable inventory of stuff, bits and pieces and nuts and bolts and hardware and light bulbs and all kinds of stuff. Another one is Production Advantage. This is again, it's an industry specific um, company. Um, they're based out on the East Coast. I think they have an office in LA now, I'm not sure. Um, but um, a lot of gaff tape and expendables and gel and Mostly started out as selling a lot of lighting expendables and then expanded out into rope and chain and, and all, a lot of rigging stuff too. So a lot of theaters, but in, entertainment industry specific products. Granger Industrial, similar to Master Car, only slight, only different. Um, the, the, again, they're a, they're designed for the manufacturing um, industrial applications, um, but they have all kinds of stuff. Everything you could need to run a business. Um, maintain a facility, that kind of a thing. A lot of good hardware and stuff. Fastenal, similar to Granger and McMaster Car, but mostly just fasteners, um, adhesives, tapes, glue, uh, nuts and bolts, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and again, a nationwide company, so um, you can get stuff all over the country. Rose Brand is a, another entertainment specific one. Um, they started out in New York City. Their first um, corner on the market was fabric, uh, soft goods, uh, draperies for um, scenic, uh, for theaters. And uh, they've really expanded their um, their product line out to include a lot of hardware. So if you get a hold of one of their new catalogs, they make a really great catalog and they send it out every year. It's got a lot of awesome pictures in it and a lot of good little how-tos in it in the catalog. So I encourage you to get your hand on the, on the, on the hard catalog. Um, but a lot of good stuff. They also um, have expanded. I think they have an office in LA now as well. So um, all good places to get stuff for your theater productions.